Good morning. Good morning. I'm Ann Fowler, and I welcome all of you to St. Luke's this morning, including everybody who's watching us online. Please be most welcome and know that we are very, very grateful to have you here this morning. Blessed be God, Creator, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, and from you known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may possibly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Savior. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, because without you we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Spirit is speaking. God's people are listening. The first lesson for this morning is from Genesis. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph saying, your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. 
Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I the place Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve the numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. The Spirit is speaking. The second lesson for this morning is from Romans. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain And those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. 
Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is, be, it is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. The Holy Gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often do I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, the one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, the Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payments to be made. So the slave fell to his knees before him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him, owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused, 
and then he went and threw him into prison until he could pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, the Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of our Savior. Praise Praise you, Lord Christ. Congregation, please be seated. It may not be um, entirely obvious as, as you hear this morning's gospel that that first question that Peter asked of Jesus, he thought he was being pretty magnanimous. How often should I forgive? As many as seven times, that's what he asked Jesus. What you, what you may not know is that in, in Jewish law, the, the law that kind of ordained this relationship between Jesus and his disciples, in order um, to forgive someone, you simply had to ask for their forgiveness three times. And after you'd forgiven them three times, that was it. You didn't have to forgive them anymore. And so Peter's thinking, the law says three times. How about if I double it and, and add one more for good measure? Seven times? That certainly ought to be enough, even for this Jesus person, right? How often should I forgive? It's a question that all of us probably understand because it's another way of asking, when am I free of forgiving others? Is there a number? Forgiveness is a hard topic for us to get our minds around. And in fact, I'm going to invite you not into a a conversation that actually has answers, but, but an opportunity to reflect on how we relate to God's community and how God relates to us. I said after the um, 7.30 service that, um, that people walked out with more questions they had when, than they began. And then I said, I hope to see you next week. And some of them said, you might, right? <laughs> Just warning you. How often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus' response points out the very misunderstanding of the topic of forgiveness itself. Because what we know is forgiveness at its core is already an immeasurable and limitless act. It must be. And what I know about forgiveness is that it's central to every healthy and good relationship, even and especially in our relationship with God. Now, it's very easy to see why Peter gets it wrong. Peter is like many of us and and writes himself as the the sinner person in every play, right? He himself places himself at the center of the narrative and he can only kind of imagine himself as the one who has been wronged rather than the one who is asking of forgiveness. But what we know about ourselves and, and what we know about Peter is that, that, that ultimately the question is not about us forgiving other people and more about God forgiving us. If the shoe were on the other foot, Peter certainly could see things differently. He would be, if he would only ask the question, how often should I be forgiven? He might see the error of his thinking. But it certainly isn't easy to keep ourselves out of the middle of things 
and to make ourselves the generous ones rather than the ones who are in need of mercy. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is so hard for us. It is the hardest work of love. But what I know about forgiveness is that forgiveness enlarges the future in a way that is beyond our comprehension. And Jesus' response to Peter is, is meant to invite that same feeling. That the forgiveness that God offers us is beyond our comprehension. And therefore, we ought to forgive others in the same way. Here is the, what I've learned to be the truth. Forgiveness is a constant. Forgiveness is not optional. And forgiveness is not a choice. Now, don't get me wrong. We want it to be. And that's at the heart of Peter's question. That he himself has the power to either hold resentment or let it go. Or free someone from whatever problems or whatever brokenness exists in a relationship. But that's not exactly what Jesus is talking about. Jesus' answer to Peter in the parable he tells in continuation of response describe a kind of generosity that we have a hard time understanding and yet it, as the, it is at the very center of what it means to follow Jesus. We are asked to forgive because we have been forgiven and yet we cannot bring ourselves to understand and accept the endless and inestimable nature of forgiveness that Jesus assumes in his life and death and resurrection and what that means for our willingness to forgive others. As I've gotten older, I find that I'm inclined to order and measure. You can ask my kids about that. They will back it up. I used to be all footloose and fancy free, but now I'm a list maker. Peter's question, how many times should I forgive, could easily have come for me because then once I got the magical number, I could check it off my list and move on to the next task. I see some noddings of heads. Maybe there's some other list makers among us. I, like Peter, long for a mathematical equation that I might apply to my broken relationships. But God's forgiveness is immeasurable. And according to this morning's gospel, so ought ours be too. One of the ways in which you know it's immeasurable is that Jesus uses a very particular word. In, in this parable that he's telling to the, to, to, the, to the crowd, right, that's assembled around Peter about what, about what this role of, of, of God's forgiveness of his servants is going to be, he uses the word myroi, and it's a Greek word for 10,000. 10,000 talents is what he owed. But, but what you should know is that that word, myroi, it was the largest possible number known in those times. It's unclear what that servant did to amass such a debt. It's hard to imagine. But here they were with an unimaginable debt. A debt that could not be repaid in many, many, many lifetimes, in children's lifetimes. And yet, by simply asking God for forgiveness, his master, all is well. What I hear in this morning's teaching is that God's way refuses to bend toward our need for reasoning and explanation. This generosity is beyond measure. We cannot fathom the amount of grace poured out for us. Faith, we learn, is not a mathematical equation but an entirely new way. But one of the reasons why this morning's gospel is so hard for me to hear and to talk at all about forgiveness is that um, it evokes the reflection of the work that I have left to do in forgiving others. And it's meant to. All of these parables are meant to invite us into both the role of the master and the role of the one asking for mercy. And what I find is that the servant in the parable could just as easily be me. I told you I'm a list maker, right? 
I could probably give you a list of those people that I'm unwilling to forgive. Have you got a list? Thinking about that list makes me wonder on who is waiting for my forgiveness and about relationships fractured by my own stubbornness and my desire to be right rather than righteous. What would it take? How many times would they have to ask me for forgiveness? Three, like the law. Seven, like Peter. 490, like Jesus, or an unlimited amount? How many times would they have to ask before I remove them from the list? And, and then furthermore, what about those people on the list that I've deemed unforgivable right out of hand? What Jesus is asking us of us is complex. And he's asking, basically, to upend the basic structures of how we negotiate relationships. He's asking us to move beyond quantifiable measurements. That, that, the basic equation is, you do this for me and I do this for you. And he's asking us to move into trust that going together, going forward together, is far preferable than being alone and right. When I was wondering about kind of how to put all this into words this week, I, I came across a, a great scholar named Caroline Lewis, and, and she's provided a lot of inspiration for me. And, and, and what she says about this particular piece, I'm going to share for you word for word, because the way that she says it is, well, it gives me hope. She says, we live and feel more comfortable with a way of being with each other that is quantifiable and transactional. That's true for me. We like knowing how much we have to give and what we will get in return. That's true for me. This seems especially true when it comes to forgiveness. We should ask ourselves, why is it that we want and need forgiveness to be computable and calculable? We want confines and controls for forgiveness parameters and strictures, conditions and qualifiers. Ironically, that's not what we usually want for ourselves, is it? We want unlimited forgiveness from each other, and yet we're unable to offer it to someone else. Now, I've come to believe that the reason that we have such a problem with forgiving others and even forgiving ourselves is that we can't reconcile the truth of God's forgiveness of us. At its heart, this, this thing that sits on us, right, that harbors resentment and makes us make lists and asks Peter and causes Peter to ask, How many times, Lord? is resistance to forgive that derives from our difficulty of believing that we ourselves can be forgiven. But we can be forgiven. We are forgiven. We pray for Forgiveness of our sins, known and unknown. Things done and left undone. Those words roll from our lips, and yet at their heart, they are a true statement of grace. Of a deep desire for reconciliation with God. And a reconciliation with one another. I'm sorry I don't have answers for you this morning. Maybe the purpose of, of this meditation on forgiveness is to invite ourselves into considering who is on our list and why they're there. Do we think that we're powerful for having a list? 
God has no list. You are not on a list. By his grace, he has delivered a salvation that we cannot earn by asking the right questions or asking the right amount of times or anything else in the world. Our salvation is earned because we are beloved children of God. Forgiveness. It's hard. It's complicated. And it's the only way. Sometimes when words fail, I turn to prayer books. We've got a great tradition here of other people saying things that are too hard for me to say on my own. In this case, I, I found this prayer book, this prayer for forgiveness in the English Book of Common Prayer. It, it, it derives from 1662, but the, ing- the language that I'm going to use is modern, and I, and I lift it for you in conclusion to this morning's homily. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than either we desire or deserve. Pour down upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid of giving and giving us those good things which we are not worthy to ask. But by the merits, and here's where it gets good, by the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us stand as we are able and recite the story of our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, eternally begotten of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, truth from light, to God from truth, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory, judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people can be found on page seven of your bulletin. Blessed God, whose love calls the whole creation into covenant with you, and who puts in our hands responsibility for the care of the earth and its creatures, we pray for all to whom you have given life and being, saying, Merciful God, keep your planet and people in peace. For the well-being of the earth, for its water, air, soil, minerals, and energy, that we may learn sustainable consumption of them and they may be tended for the good of all creatures, we pray. For the earth's living beings, wild and domestic, large and very small, 
even those who do us harm, and those whose place in our creation we do not understand or welcome, that we may all know the harmony of relationship that sustains all life, we pray. For your church and all its members, especially Michael, our presiding bishop, Thomas, our bishop, George, our interim dean, all the staff and people of this cathedral church, Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Augusta, for farmers, fishermen, and the harvest, that we may be a voice of witness for the reverent care of your world, we pray. For all who shape public policies affecting the planet and its creatures, especially Joseph, our president, Janet, our governor, and members of our city council, including Kate, Pius, and April, that they may consider wisely the well-being of all who come after us, we pray. For all those engaged in conservation and in the various industries that draw from the gifts of your creation, that the health, fruitfulness, and beauty of the natural world may be sustained alongside human activity, we pray. For the creatures and human beings of your world who are ill, or in danger, pain, or special need, especially those suffering from the effects of the recent natural disasters in Morocco and Libya, and for all who suffer from the unjust, violent, or wasteful use of the Earth's resources, or their devastation by war, that all may someday live in communities of justice and peace, especially Judith, Joseph, Veronica, John, Gary, Janine, Luca, Danica, Dale, Jamie, Finn, Marshall, we pray. For the gifts of science and technology, and for those who practice these skills, that they may be wise, visionary, and compassionate in their work, we pray. For the creatures and the people of the earth, whose lives and deaths have contributed to the fruitful abundance of this planet, remembering especially the Reverend Warren Radke, who died last week, we pray. Gracious God, grant that your, may, your people may have in them the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, and guide us into harmony of relationship through loving kindness and wi the wise use of all you have given. For you are drawing all things in communion with you and with each other by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Holy and merciful God, we confess that we have failed to honor you by rightly claiming our kinship with all your creatures. We have walked heavily on your earth, overused and wasted its resources, taken for granted its beauty and abundance, and treated its inhabitants unjustly, holding future generations hostage to our greed. Have mercy on us and forgive us our sin. Renew in us the resolve to keep and conserve your earth as you desire and intend with grateful and compassionate hearts. Through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins through our Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. And now may the peace of Christ be always with you. And also with you. Peace. Peace, peace, and please be seated. I am, um, you guys know that. The sextons start their work around 4 o'clock in the morning on Sunday mornings. And what that means is I can get coffee anytime I want. <laughs> and I came down early this morning, and, and the coffee was made, and wouldn't you know that Sam was sitting there, right? And we were talking about forgiveness. He said, what are you going to preach about? And I said, forgiveness. And he said, I'm not coming. <laughs> That's not true. He said what he had learned when he was a young priest many, many years ago about when forgiveness is actually done. Like, when do we know we've actually forgiven? He said, um, you know you've truly forgiven someone when it no longer hurts to think about it. What's key about that, and, and as I was thinking about it, was what's key about that is this is very different than forgive and forget, right? Forgive and forget does not exist, but forgive and not let it hurt does, and there's wisdom there, isn't there? I just want to say that it occurred to me that forgiveness is a process. And for those of you who have unreconciled kind of work to do around forgiveness, just know that our God is so stubborn in his love for us. And so keep trying. That's all I can do, right? couple of very brief announcements for you. One of them is, of course, if you're visiting with us, you recognize that we're in the season of creation, and, and our book of common, pr our, our prayers are, are featured around the kind of common call for creation, our, our prayers of the people, and our uh, Eucharistic prayer, and some of our prayers are built around this. Now, on Thursday of this week, we are having a special dinner, um, a first parish dinner of the fall. Um, we'd love for you to sign up. There are various ways to do it. It's in our bulletin, and you can register online. But if you're not a register online person, there's also a physical sign-up sheet um, when you go to coffee hour, and we hope you all will come to coffee hour. The other thing that I want to mention to you all is that um, I've heard from so many of you that you've been receiving emails from me. And guess what? I'm not sending you emails. Already, what's so interesting is in my two weeks here, already there's been a, a you know, the kind of the spam bots have picked up my email and are asking you all to send gift cards for our staff, which is a great idea, <laughs> except for they're diverting those gen your generosity to other people. Believe me, I am thankful for our staff, and I want to tell you that I'm not emailing you asking you, have you got a minute, which is what the text says, or can you do me a favor? I may ask you later, but this isn't that. Um, so just be aware that um, this is a scam that's been happening. It happened for Ben, it happened for Suzanne, it's happened for probably every organization that you're a part of. But there's something about preying on the generosity of church people that makes me mad. Should I forgive them? That's the question. I'll have to pray about it. I think I got it, right? Is that all the announcements, Sam? What I miss? This table is welcome for all of you, right? One of the things that's interesting is that, is that Jesus broke bread with, with, with his disciples before the betrayal, right? And it was meant to kind of invoke this kind of need for ongoing relationship, which is only comes from, from the person of Jesus. And so, so 
if you, if you have a need, right, bring your need to this table and know that you are welcome, um, and then the ushers will send you forward to do that work. So would you walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself as an offering and sacrifice to God?
May God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to God. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time you made ready the creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being, sun, moon, and stars, earth, winds, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways, but we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day, we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. and honor and praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to reveal the riches of your grace, you looked with favor upon Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, the holy child of God. Living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners. He healed the sick and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself, yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to them and, and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you, gave it to them and said, drink this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you and for all. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now, gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts that they may be the body and blood of Christ. And breathe your spirit in the fullness of time. Bring us with blessed Luke and all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all, all honor, to glory, and praise be to you forever and ever.
As our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep peace. Alleluia. the gifts of God for the people of God, holy food for holy people.
let us pray. Eternal God, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now in the world in peace and grant us strength to push, love, and serve you. Let us in singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Everything around us is God's creation. Wherever you look, wherever you walk, Christ is there. The Holy Spirit infuses all creation. May the triune God who creates, sustains, and redeems us all be gracious to us, bless us, and shine upon us. Amen. Beloved people of God, let us go in peace to love and serve God in God's creation. Thanks, Thanks be to God.